Good evening and welcome to Mr. Wilson Live. We're streaming from Kingston, Jamaica in the Caribbean. And this evening we have a rather interesting lineup as we're going to be looking at sewage disposal. We're going to be looking a little bit at the growth of a population. And we're also going to be looking at biotechnology. It's a really interesting lineup, one that promises to foster some debate and one for most persons uh, might be the very first time we are coming across some of the content that is supposed to be presented today. If this is going to be our last live class. If we have other lives, it definitely won't be uh, a class, so to speak, as in completing the syllabus. It will be more like classes to look at alternative topics like graphs and tables and labs that type of stuff, but we won't be having the three lineup that you are accustomed to. We are going to be putting out, uh, hopefully, more videos for you. We are going to be looking for those problem topics. We are going to be looking for those things that you have not been seeing for quite a while, are those things that would have appeared on the paper probably once. We are definitely going to be putting out the 2019, uh, 2019 paper as was requested. It is coming in short order. We were able this morning to put out a 2016 biology paper and that had some work on it and it had some graph on it and it had some genetics on it. Uh, so you really want to check that paper out, be that you are a biology or HSB student. You want to pretty much look at what is happening on that paper. Like I come continue to say, it's pretty much almost the same exam with the exception that um, bio has more plants and HSB would have more disease. So we have a lot planned here for, for you this evening. I do hope that you are fine wherever you are in the Caribbean. I realize that my friends in St. Vincent, they, were, they are gonna be doing the exam a little later than other persons. They are gonna be doing the exam, I think, somewhere there in August. So we're praying for them, and we hope that all will be well soon. I haven't had any news out of St. Vincent since Lately, I think when Martin is on, I'll ask Martin what is happening there, being that Martin now is back in St. Vincent. But we're we're doing good. Today was the actual last day at school, face to face. I'm just leaving work, heading back home. Uh, so students are now on a break, a uh, study break, so to speak. Uh, we just collected some SBA books just now. I hope I got all the books, but we're going to be marking SBAs. It's going to be a busy week moving into next week, where we're going to be having the end of year examination for a lot of schools and following the end of year exam on the 28th, which is just probably a week away, a lot of persons will be sitting their first exam. And for you, we are hoping the best. Now, what we're covering today is pretty much the last part of the syllabus, probably the part of the syllabus that a lot of persons, uh, or a lot of teachers probably wouldn't have covered we are going to be going through a lot. I'm going to be giving you some links to look at some stuff if, so that if we are not able to build these videos in time, you would have had a good great understanding. But one of the things that we want to look at, and I'm going to be showing you a book here again, uh, the Macmillan, this book. Don't know if you have it. I hope you have a copy. There is a diagram on this book that came on both the HSV paper. Screenshot it if you must. Uh, go to Google to find it. Uh, this diagram is uh, insulin recombinant technology. Uh, you really want to know that. It appeared on both the biology and the HSP paper as the final question on the exam paper. I think about two years in a row. So you definitely want to do that. I think probably two other, the artist diagram for, for either subject is going to be the menstrual cycle. A lot of persons really don't like the menstrual cycle. I want to do a video on the menstrual cycle to see how best I can decode that so that students can have a better understanding. If you have not yet liked, share, and subscribe, it might be the best time to do so now. And when you subscribe, remember to click that notification bell and select all so you'll be notified. For those persons who are in distant land, please be reminded, if you don't subscribe, there are some videos that you might not have access to. So you want to ensure that you subscribe, that you have all our videos and all the resources that is needed for your exam. So once again, good evening. Tamara, you're in the room. How are you doing? Khan, how are you doing? 
and I'm seeing Abigail. Good evening and welcome to the show. I'm also seeing Peter Gate Campbell. Good evening. And I'm seeing Roxanne. Good evening and welcome to the show. We are going to be wrapping up the show this evening. We want to start with looking by looking at sewage disposal. And particularly, we are looking at the disposal of commercial sewage. But in looking at the disposal of commercial sewage, there are some things we want to look at uh, when we talk about commercial sewage. In that, we want to again recap the whole idea as to why is it important for us to have uh, sewage management. Now, that is a really, really big thing. If you want to share with me in the chat, I'd be very happy to hear from you. Why is it that we need to have uh, sewage management? Sewage management, why is that important? Very important point for us. Just tell me in the chat, why is it important for us to have sewage management? All right, waiting for that. Why is it important for us to have sewage management? Why is it important for us to have sewage management? Just give me a bit. I am looking for something here. Okay, great. This is what I'm looking for. Well, so many stuff. All right, so as you get warm up or warmed up, let me just remind us that in our show last night, yes, we had a show last night. It was one of those shows, it was a little impromptu where we looked at uh we looked at graphs on table last night. It was about an hour there, about 53 minutes there about. Uh just showing up your skill on tables and graphs. All right, so we're looking at sewage treatment today that's the first thing we want to look at and why we want to look at sewage treatment is because sewage continues to be a problem to manage in the world uh, one might say to us it is a major problem in the caribbean now it becomes a major problem in the caribbean as the population is increasing and we are attracting more and more tourists so as such this sewage must be addressed, must be dealt with, and we cannot allow the sewage to flow freely because if we do, what is likely to happen is that we might be exposing ourselves to things like typhoid, cholera, dysentery, and you name the whole slew of diseases that are associated with sewage and sewage disposal. Now, we have looked at pit latrine, and we want to look at the commercial treatment of sewage now. And remember that there is actually two methods that we can look at. We can look at one. We can look at one, the activated sludge method. And two, we can look at what is called a bio biological filter method. So first thing we need to get in our mind, there are two ways of dealing with sewage commercially. There is the biological filter, filter method, and there is the activated sludge method. The biological filter method and the activated sludge treatment method. Now, both processes involve some basic steps. So we are going to be going through and we are going to be looking at it and we are going to realize that some of the things that we are going to be talking about X, they are pretty much common for both X and Y. So Peter Gay Chambly said, because it is harmful to living organisms and it can also cause a lot of disease and contaminate water bodies. And this is like really, really nice because the contamination of water bodies is going to increase that phosphate content, increase the nutrient content of the water. And then you understand that we're going to be heading into what we refer to as eutrophication. So like I said, there are two main methods that can be used to treat sewage commercially. You need to remember them. The activated sludge method and the biological filter method. It is important to note 
that both these methods have some principles in common. When we get to that point of deviating, I will definitely share with you what makes the difference. So here we go. The first step in sewage treatment involves screening. So the sewage is flowing from your home, from the municipal. The first, things that, first thing that is done is that which we refer to as screening. Now, what happens during screening? Now, during screening, the sewage flow through a grid, or what we refer to as a screen, that filter thing, where large particles are removed and burned. So the first thing that happens is that we want to remove the larger particles. Those particles are those uh, things that will uh, actually block the sewage system. They are pretty much screen removed, after which they are, of course, burned. So the first thing that we do in sewage treatment commercially is to do a screening. And a screening is pretty much to remove the larger solid content that can be burned. Another thing that we need to know about the screening is that the sewage is allowed to flow through a grid or through a filter. Now, I want you to pay attention to the fact that we are talking about sewage now, because as we get deeper into the lesson, we are going to be talking about sludge and effluent, not sewage. Sludge and effluent. Now, after the sewage would have passed through the screen or the filter, it is going to go into a grit pit, right? Now, this pretty much what it does is to slow down the process or slow down the passage of sewage and allow for the grit to settle. And it's upstairs or downstairs? Turn it? Okay. So what will happen here, having passed through the screen, it gets into a grid pit, and then the suspended particles, as much as possible, they are going to be allowed to pretty much settle. After we would have completed the screening process, the other thing that we want to do, and this is the biggest part of uh, the process, this part of the process involves uh, a process, a big process that we refer to as sedimentation. So after screening, we have sedimentation. Now, in sedimentation, what happens here is that the solid material settles to the bottom as sludge. So we came in as sewage, went through that uh, screening into that grid pit. Uh, sedimentation is taking place now. The solid is going to pretty much fall, and it will fall. And when it falls, what, what is settled at the bottom there, we refer to it as sludge but this is the important part in this process we could add any of the following we could add ferric sulfate and this can be added uh pretty much to see sorry this can be added to speed up the settling of a clump or to speed up the settling uh, of course, to cause the particles to clump. One would say that the foculation process takes place here, where in the sediment chamber, we are adding ferric sulfate. And you will remember that we had used ferric sulfate before. And pretty much for the same thing, for the coagulation process, for what we refer to as foculation, for the process to, for the uh, particles to clump together so that they can be easily removed. So it is within the sedimentation that we use that bit. So remember, the portion that falls out of the sewage coming in to the bottom, it forms that we refer to as sludge. What remains as fluid with some amount of suspended particle is called effluent. All right. So the effluent will, of course, be on top. That is the liquid portion and the sludge will fall to the bottom. But interestingly, the design will allow sludge, the solid particle, to be pumped into tanks where bacteria will decompose the sludge. So the pumping action is going to be under the effluent. It's going to be pumped out into a tank 
where, of course, bacteria can continue breaking down the sewage. Now, the sludge digester is a very, very important part of this whole chain of event. Now, the sludge digester, here we are going to have methane uh, being produced from the anaerobic breakdown. Remember, in respiration, we spoke about uh, aerobic and anaerobic. So here in the sludge digester, methane is going to be produced, which is the simplest gas, CH4. The 4 is a subscript of the CH. And wh why this happens is because there's some action of anaerobic, uh, anaerobic bacteria, uh, anaerobic respiration on the sludge. This may be burnt into fuel. What will be burnt into fuel? Of course, the methane that is, of course, produced in the sludge digester can be used as a source of fuel. This methane can be used as a source of fuel. Now, some sludge is also dried here. And when it is dried, uh, what we do, we, we put it on land actually to dry. From the sludge chamber, sludge digester, some of the sludge is, of course, removed and it is placed on the land to dry. Now, this dried sludge is used as manure. This dried sludge is used as manure. But we need to listen to this a bit. While this dried sludge is used as manure, it is not used on root crop. Now, we have to be very careful with root crop here because yam is actually a stem, stem crop. So it is not used on any crop that would have the, uh, the part that we're consuming under, uh, under the ground. Neither is it used on vegetable crops. It is, of course, used in orchard where it will not be in contact with the part of the plant that we are eating. So yes, the dry sludge can be used in agriculture, providing that it is treated properly, but it is not used with root crop, neither is it used with vegetable crop. All right? It cannot be used on parts of the plant that you are going to eat. And that is why no vegetable crop, no root crop. The process continues. In what we refer to as a percolating filter. We continue in what we refer to as a percolating filter. And this is where we refer to as the biofilter now taking place. So the process is somewhat uh, changed now to where, where we get to biofilter. So once we would have gotten through screening and we would have gotten through sedimentation, this is where both processes now can break apart. We can either go to the biological filter method or we can go to the activated sludge method. So all I have said so far is common to both of the processes. Now we are going to look at what happens if we are doing the biological or using the biological filter method. What is going to happen first is that this effluent is going to flow through a percolating filter it will be allowed to trickle, so to speak. This process is used to treat the, the effluent that is coming from the sedimentation tank. Now, it is usually actually flowed in a concrete tank, which is about two meter high, and of course, filled with what we refer to as clicking coke with what we call clicking coke or some small stones. So the first thing that happens after leaving the sediment chamber is that the effluent will, of course, flow into what we refer to as the percolating filter. Now, it is about two meters high, and it has in it what we call clicking coke, or we could have some small stone. Why do we need this? The stones will be used for what we refer to develop this food chain. So the stones will be covered with a film of bacteria and protozoa. 
it's very important to remember this part. These stones within this area will be covered with bacteria and protozoa. Now, the clicking or the clicker coke, whichever one you want to call it, it will ensure that there is, of course, good aeration. It ensures that there is good aeration to allow maximum activity for both the bacteria and the protozoa. Now, this is very, very important in ensuring that the process continue as should are in, in ensuring that aerobic respiration takes place. Now, the effluent is sprinkled on, on, of course, these from what we refer to as uh, rotating pipes. So on the clicker thing, the effluent, you have what we call some, uh, it's some pipes that are pretty much going around that tank. And what you have is that the effluent is of course sprinkled on these stone from the rotating pipes uh pretty much that is what really increases the aeration in the process now we are going to have some things in it like we're referred to as the larvae from the flies and the larvae from the flies they will help to speed up the process of decomposition here i must pause to talk about uh, the whole idea of saprophytic nutrition and here you'd observe that with the digestion of feces the whole idea of decomposers is very very important because when we look at the bacteria they are decomposers and we're looking at the larvae they are digitivore and all these are very very important in breaking down the feces or in yeah breaking down the feces to a manageable portion that can be, of course, uh, be dispersed or be disposed of uh, probably on land and in water. It is treated and tested before that happens. Now, the effluent from the filter is, of course, going to pass through what we refer to as a humus tank to allow any remaining solid to settle. So after we, we are now in the aeration process, the biological filter process, so it's going to pass through what we refer to a filter tank. And of course, this filter tank will allow any other suspended particles to fall from the effluent. Now, the effluent, remember, this is the liquid portion as a sludge has already fallen. The effluent is then passed to the environment. The effluent is then passed to the environment. Of course, before that happens, it is tested. So here we know that the process pretty much begins with screening. We remember that, which is a filtration process. And then we are going to move on into sedimentation. And then when we, after sedimentation, that is when we can break the process into either we are going to be doing the biological filter method, or we're going to be using the activated sludge method. So there we spoke a little bit about the uh, biological filter method. Now we're going to be looking at the, uh, the effluent uh, passing through what we refer to as the activated method. So we're looking at the activated sludge. Now in the activated sludge method, these are some of the things that happen. The effluent is passed into an aeration tank. So it is passed into an aeration tank. Remember, with the biological filter method, we had this thing spinning and pretty much trickling out the effluent. But here, the effluent for the activated method, the effluent is actually passed into an aeration tank. Now, in that aeration tank, we have what is called compressed air. And this compressed air is, of course, going to force through the fluid. So it will force through the fluid, thus increasing the amount of oxygen in the tank. Now, this supply enough oxygen, uh, one would say, for the aerobic bacteria to pretty much start and continue the process of sewage decomposition. Now, the process can be enhanced by what we refer to as some paddle, right? The paddle can assist with the mixing of the sewage so as to keep it pretty much a little more suspended so that 
the decomposition can take place a little faster. Now, the effluent is, of course, passed to what we refer to as settling or humus tank. Yes, we had a settling tank before in the biological aeration process, but what was different is that we had something feeding this, the effluent from above. I was passing on the click of coke, I'm passing on stone, and that helped to increase the aeration. Now we have the effluent for the activated sludge flowing into a tank with compressed air, and this is actually passed through the liquid to, of course, increase the aeration. Now, at this point, that is after it has reached into what we refer to as the humus tank, at this point, the sludge has activated bacteria. Listen to what happened now, because it's really interesting here. And some of the sludge is going to be pumped back into the aeration tank. Now, you understand we have enough bacteria here, so we are pumping back some of the sludge into the aeration tank. While we are doing that, we are adding bacteria to increase the speed of decomposition. Now, the remaining sludge is, of course, disposed of. You understand that this remaining sludge is, of course, treated and disposed. So, of course, if they would have tested to see if they're safe to be released into the environment. Now, in both sewage, in both process, the sewage is broken. You would have realized. So in both, both processes, you would have seen that the sewage would have been broken down into what we refer to as sludge and the liquid portion we call effluent. Now, the solid portion is, of course, dried and it can be used in orchard field and the liquid portion is treated and most times released in water body. Now, the harmful organisms that are a part of this sewage, they would have been destroyed throughout the entire process of treating the sewage. Now, usually on your paper for human and social biology, the common thing on the paper is for you to look at or list the steps that are involved in sewage treatment. Another popular question around sewage treatment is the whole idea of you uh, distinguishing between the activated sludge method and the biological filter method. With the activated sludge method, there are two things that stands out. One, the compressed air that is actually passed through the, the, the effluent. And two, the fact that there is some, after it passes the, 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 uh, the humus tank, some of this uh, activated bacteria is now pumped back into the aeration tank. That is not the case, as it were, for the biological filter method. In the biological filter method, we have what is called clicking coca, we have stone, and we have this rotating dispenser dispensing the, the effluent onto the stone. And in that process, it increases the aeration, make it, making it easy for the aerobic bacteria to decompose. So you need to have that little bit locked. So what I'm going to do for you, I'm going to uh, do a video for you. What's the difference? And we're going to look at the exact difference between the activated sludge method and, of course, the aeration method. This takes us now into some new domain. New domain. And what we're going to be looking at, remember, we're on the last part of the syllabus. So I'm going to be looking at some stuff that probably most persons wouldn't cover or you would not have covered it yet unless you're like Amoy. Amoy would have com completed this some time ago. We want to look at aging. What makes me old? What makes me young? How can we stop aging? How can we stop aging? All right, so we, are comp we have completed water treatment. We have completed sewage. Now we're looking at aging. How, what is aging really? Now, if we look at what is happening in the world, the world population continues to grow significantly. And a part of this reason is because of the advances in technology. And many they are, you are going to learn this evening. Now, with this advanced technology, we are now paying attention to everything. What is efficient versus what is not efficient. 
And with this said, there comes the whole concept of things that are even ethical thoughts are those that are unethical. Now, looking at the blooming population, looking at what we seem not to be able to control, aging, as the Bible would say that we're given three score and ten, and then after that, anything else, it is uh, you're on overtime. But what causes us to age? There are many schools of thought as to what really causes us to age. Now, the reason for aging is not really known. It is not really known. But there are some theories that really uh, summarize or goes close to what we think is aging. We could say we age because God said that we should age. The Bible said it should be three score and ten. So that is a theory that we could go with. But there is a theory of aging that is linked to lepto. My teacher did not teach aging. And that's not in my summary text. Summary text I have. Never mind, am I? I'm just drawing you out. I am happy to see you because usually when you come, you don't come on and say anything. So I'm drawing you out, am I? Good evening and welcome to the show, am I? Uh, we're happy you're here. All right. So we have this fancy word. I'm going to spell it for Amoy. L-I-P-O-F-U-S-C-H-I-N. Nobody typed it? So it's lipo fusion or chin. That is a theory. And the theory behind this is that if lipofuscin, 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 lipofuscin. Now, if lipofuscin is a pigment that is found in aging organ. So when you start to get old, we we'll find this pigment. It's called lipofuscin. It is found in aging organ. Now, it is believed to alter the metabolic process or to inhibit the metabolic process or to slow down the metabolic process, thus causing aging. So that is a school of thought that you might be aging as a result. All, all my years in school, I never heard that word. All right, great. And like I said, this class is going to really unveil a lot of things that you've never heard before, but there are things that appear on the syllabus every now and then. All right? They're trying to remove aging cell. All right, am I, are we, are we need am I for this class, you know, because I have some ethical things that I want to talk about. We're going to talk about eugenics. eugenics. We're going to talk about uh, euthanasia and I'm I being this health person uh, might be upset with me this evening. I'm going to try to keep it cool that I don't really offend anyone. Anyhow, let's take it down. Now, what we what they have found out, not we, I'm not there as yet. What they have found out is that if they use anti-lipophosgen, anti-lipophosgen drugs, if they use that drugs for persons who are If I use that drug for persons who are aged and suffering from confusion, what they have found out is that these persons usually recover from that confusion. So remember that the lipophosgen is a pigment, chemical, found in aging organs. And if they use the reverse of that, which is the anti lipophosgen what they have found out is that persons who are suffering from, they call it confusion. Some person might say dementia or something like that. Um, am I, what is it? Uh, they usually use this drug to correct the problem. Now, there's also alternative school of thought. Another alternative thought is that the immune system pretty much is malfunctioning because it has worked so long so well 
and now it's no longer working well. Now, what happens here is that it leads to the antibodies attacking the body organs, right? Example, in some cases of arthritis, it is just the body attacking itself, right? So we have three school of thought so far. One, what's the first one? It might be the Bible, religion, the God factor. It might be as a result of the three score and ten. It might be lipofostrin. Or it might be that uh, disorientation. Great am I. Uh, it might be that also what is happening is that uh, we have aged and the body is just attacking itself because uh, it is really, really old. And what does that mean is that the immune system is not functioning as it should. It is now malfunctioning. There's also another school of thought, as it were, for aging, that the DNA becomes faulty after so many times of replicating. Right? So you would see example of this when you are looking at a skin that is damaged by the sun. That skin tends to be aged. Right? So they say faulty DNA might be the reason for aging, but they are trying to figure out what really causes aging. Now, the genetic control is uh, another school of thought. Genetic control, it is just the way the body should work. The genes say, listen to me, three score and 10 are whatever age, everything must start malfunctioning. You must die within a certain time so that you can be replaced on the earth and you can pretty much become a part of the food web or food chain because other organisms need to live and they are not pneumatic, so they are pretty much not living from air. So that is also a possibility. That is just genetic control that causes this to happen. I think aging is just a result of a body and, it is, and its organ becoming uh, worn over time. Um, that is possible. That's a school of thought, right? So the, the parts become worn as such the immune system is not working anymore and you age. But what you understand here, I want everybody to look at what is happening here, is that the scientists, they are not giving up and finding a better way to live life and a longer way to live life. And that is where you guys will come in, in adding to this conversation of growth. I tell you that this lesson moving forward is going to get really, really interesting. Now, the problem, there's a problem, however, with this aging concept. And if your loved one is listening, this might be rated as zero for aged persons. It might be disturbing the things that I'm going to say now. But these are things that are pretty much being discussed. So I suggest to you, if you have loved one listening that will hurt that, what I'm going to say will hurt them, use an earphone. Use an earphone. So there's a problem with the aging society. And some of the problems that are associated with the aging society, you tell me them. Tell me in the chat, what are some of the problems that is associated with that age society? What are some of the problems that are associated with that aid society? What are some of the problems that are associated with that aid society? I am going to be sending you a link. A link that I really want you to have. I am going to be doing the past paper. I don't know that I can teach this concept that is pretty novel to you by just talking about it. So I'm going to be sending a link in short order for the population pyramids as I want you to have a good grasp. But if you get to the exam, I'll also talk about how you can solve the question that was on the paper. It was a very, very easy question if you ask me, as it were, for population pyramid. They usually are a little more difficult, but all you needed to do in, in that exam paper, I think it probably was 2018, 
was to use a ruler to do the measurement. All right, so coming back over there, just trying to get that thing that I should get for you. All right, so I'm going to give you a task to do. I'm going to type it in the chat. I am coming back to you guys. Don't worry yourself too seriously. Uh, I want you to look for this, T-Y-P-E-S, Types of Population Pyramid. Just write it down. You really don't have to do it now. Types of population pyramids. I want you to look at them because each of the shape tells a story. All right. So I want you to look at types of population pyramid. I want you to look at, uh, just write it down. And uh, what you can do, you could just find a video on YouTube that addresses population pyramid. I have only seen it on, seen it on one CXC paper. One. I've never seen it again. I think it probably was on the 2019 idea about CXC paper. That population pyramid. I want you to just go and read it so you have a good interpretation and listen it on YouTube. Let me see what you are saying here. Uh, some of the problems that are associated with the aging population is that some will, of course, uh, be stressed. I don't know if it's stress you or they will be stressed. They have problem with unhealthy diet. They might face with Alzheimer, uh, underlying health issues, I guess, diabetes, cancer, uh diabetes come again yes uh geriatric alcoholism and uh the list goes on and on so some of the things that those are right some of the things that are associated with the aging population is that those who are aged they need care because they are no longer part of the workforce other than needing care they also need medication and in most cases they are not working and the little that they would have saved probably is depleted. Then outside of medication, they also must be fed. Outside of being uh, fed, they need clothing. Outside of clothing, they also need housing. Now, all of this will come to the generation that comes after at a cost if you are in urban society. In rural area, the cost might be a little lower but pretty much in the urban area, it might be really uh, costly. Now, there are ethical issues around lengthening lifetime. A lot of ethical issues around lengthening your lifetime or ethical issues around shortening your lifetime. Now, to lengthen your lifetime, Amoy will tell you, if you have a malfunctioning organ, probably like a kidney, or you have a pacemaker for the heart, there are machines that could assist you in living. You have the respirator, uh, those type of machines that help you to live a little longer. But there are some ethical issues where there might be some religion and some persons who really don't want to be a part of this mechanism. They want to go when it is time for them to go. So machine can lend your life and there are some persons who really don't want to go on the machine. There are some families who are saying, I can't afford to go on the machine. So who really is responsible for taking care of your life when you reach this point where your, your well-being is so compromised that it needs a machine to keep you going? There's another thing, and this is legal in some countries. You can type this in and find it on YouTube. Euthanasia. Euthanasia 
Euthanasia is actually called mercy killing. Mercy killing. So it's like a case where Amoy decides that I don't want to live past uh, September. A drugs will be administered and her wish will come true. Now, the problem with this, with euthanasia, if we are going to think about euthanasia, and I'm going to get a little graphic now, and we are going to look at treating persons who are really, really aged, and there are some aged persons who say, I really don't want to live anymore. Now, is it ethical for us to obey the wish of these persons to carry out euthanasia? It is something to think about. Will it save on our food supply? Will it save on our water supply? Will it save on our energy need? Is it ethical any at all? Is this something that we should consider? And if it is something that we should consider or not consider, why is it that some countries, it is legal to carry out euthanasia? Well, let us say it this way. If euthanasia is going to be a legal part of our well-being, who will decide when to pull the plug on who? Who should have that authority to say it's time to pull the plug? That's a question for us to think about as we try to live in the near future. Now, there's a lot of things that is happening out there, as it were, for the future. This is another ethical concern I'm going to be touching. And um, you're, you would have heard some of these, but I'm going to now talk about eugen, eugenics. Eugenics. All right, let me spell for you. E-U-G-E-N-I-C-S. What about the ethical commitment, uh, Amoy? So we are going to be looking at EU. G-E-N-I-C-S, eugenics. We're going to be looking at eugenics. Anybody can tell me what that is? If you were to see this on the exam, it would just value one mark. I think. What's eugenics? What it means? Why should we practice it? Ask my personal position? Yes, I think we should. My personal uh, position on euthanasia, I have none. But as it were for eugenics, I have a position. It might not be a favorable position to a lot of persons, but to me, I think it makes sense. And I think that persons need to be honest. Now, when it comes to eugenics, all right, great. When it comes to eugenics, there's a question that we need to ask, a question to be answered. Who do you love more? Do you love yourself more than your potential offspring? Or do you love your potential offspring more than your potential partner? So there are three persons in the mix. Who should you love more? Should it be you, the offspring to come, the offspring that might come, or should it be your partner? Because that's all we're going to be looking at when it comes to eugenics. Who should you love more? Tell me in the chat. Yes, you are improving life. And that sounds really favorable about improving life. Uh, I want you to break that down, uh, this improving life. Yes, it is improving life. But I'm sure Amon won't like it. All right? So it's improving life. But what's really eugenics? Improving life. So eugenic is, of course, improving human life, so to speak, or to improve the human race, so to speak. And how is it done? It is done by controlling your inheritance. It is done by controlling your inheritance, or done by controlling inheritance. So as a mother, as a father, you have a moral responsibility to ensure that the traits that are passed on to your offspring are traits that are desirable rather than traits that are just bonded in love for your partner. You just find 
the perfect biological compatible mate to produce a healthy child. That's so nice. So with eugenics, what is going to happen is that you are going to seek to find this ideal person to make your partner. I am hearing Barnett saying if you are supposed to wait and that you might die and not have a partner because it's, uh, everyone would have flaws. I really think that everyone has some amount of flaw, but there are some persons with more flaws than others. I am in no position to tell you that person should live lonely for the rest of their lives, but I am strongly an advocate that we should try to pass on the most suitable genes to our offspring so as to ensure that as a human race, we continue to be dominant on the planet. There's this other thing before I continue into eugenics. You don't want to have an offspring that you have to be at the doctor every day. You don't want to have an offspring that is pretty much a child that has to stay home in bed, can't help him or herself, or become or has to live on medication, or have to, have to live pretty much on a pharmacy. You really don't want that. So eugenics, eugenics, always remember eugenics, is simply to select the most favorable partner to ensure that the offspring that you are having is born with desirable characteristic, is born with desirable trait. And I don't even know what is desirable characteristic because somebody going to tell me they need to have ear like yours or they need to have hair a little curlier than yours or they need to have hair not as curly as yours. This person needs to be brown, black, pink, orange, purple. So when it comes to the ideal genes, I would just ration it down to those genes that will cause you to be uh, really, really ill. You know, some things that are linked in cancer, some things that have their links in bone defect, some things that have their links in uh, like cystic fibrosis. You have, uh, you have hemophilia, uh, you have sickle cell anemia. All of these are things that you should be mindful of when you are choosing your partner. I am not saying in any way that these persons should be alone. But I'm saying in all fairness, these persons must think about their offspring and what their offspring will have to face as a result of living with some of these inherited diseases. I'm not saying that you should live alone, but adoption is also a viable possibility. Now, in Practicing eugenics, there is what we refer to as selective breeding. Selective breeding. And we see that happen all the time. I think we continue to practice selective breeding, but not selective breeding to satisfy biology. It is selective breeding to satisfy economics. So I want make sure that when you go to school, you see, you don't talk to any dryad boy like Mr. Wilson. You look for the boy when father drive a BMW or a Audi or a Benz and him have a little light complexion and him ears are curly. Make sure it's him you talk to because what we are practicing here is social engineering. So what we want, we want to ensure that our offspring is favorably taken care of. There is enough money. But somewhere I saw a philosophy saying that money and wealth is a liar. Poverty is more honest. Because wealth come and go. And if you play around with wealth, you're heading right back to poverty, which is the only true thing that we know about wealth and wealth creation. So we continue with eugenics and we say that it is Selective breeding, yes, sir, I hear you. I, I don't even know what you hear. I don't even know what you hear, but I hope that is something good that you heard. Yes, sir, that is so true. Yeah, yeah, that's what we do. We try to find that person. Oh, you're not going to talk to that girl over there. So no, 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 no. If you are going to talk to that girl, I am not even going to pay any more rent for this house. I am going to leave here and go over so, right? And in some cases, we can't afford it, but we pay the money for the child to go to a prep school where they can see some other person. We started from there. But when we are practicing this uh, manipulating society, we should have more interest in inheritance, in genes, what will happen to you when you reach a certain age as a result of 
practicing these bad practices. We want to look at positive eugenics. And what positive eugenics does, it leads to improvement in genetic stock of human. It leads to improvement in genetic stock of human. And that is probably one of the reasons that persons are not allowed to practice incest. Because if they are unfavorable characteristic, they are going to be passed on. However, if they are favorable characteristic, you are going to maintain the pedigree. All right? So positive eugenics is pretty much something that is practiced that is going to improve the genetic stock of the human race. So you are not going to continue down a path of choosing a partner that is going to be affecting the human race. You are going to be a good steward of the planet Earth and make sure that when we choose, we are making that biological decision to ensure that we have the best stock, the best genetic stock moving forward. There is also that which we refer to as social engineering. Social engineering. And with social engineering, there are some countries that are offering incentive for persons to have children. Now you understand that if countries are offering incentive for persons to have children, then only naturally there are going to be some guidelines to follow. And I am not going to pay you to have any children when you are going to bring a burden to society, so to speak, as they would have it. You are going to have somebody that I'll have to take care of that cannot contribute to society. Uh, pretty much that is how it is looked at out there as we looked at as we look at efficiency. So social engineering is this concept where persons are provided with incentive in order to produce offspring. Then there is negative eugenics. Negative eugenics. And in negative eugenics, what is happening is that you avoid undesirable traits in the gene pool. So if you know that Mr. Wilson has a undesirable characteristics, uh, undesirable characteristic, you are going to stay away from Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson, you and I are really, really good friends. Nothing can come between us. You can sleep in my bed. I can sleep in your bed, but that is where it ends. We are going to be friends until death. But as it were for children, we understand. We really don't want to cross that line because we are going to be adding unfavorable characteristics to the gene pool, and we have a responsibility to ensure that we have the best breeding stock moving forward. Sir, can you please spell that word? E-U, it's somewhere in the chat, you know. E-U-G-E-N-I-C-S, eugenics. And we're looking at the rise in population, some of the things that we can do. Uh, I don't really want to use examples, but we are seeing things on the news. We are seeing things all over the place. I want to think that we have to do when we see these things, we have to analyze. Every time I see them, we have to analyze. Was this a problem that was brought onto persons as a result of their parent being careless? As a result of parent being selfish, knowing that I have an undesirable trait that affects me this way, and my offspring, it will affect them in a similar manner, and they continue to do the same thing oh euthanasia okay it is euthanasia no euthanasia is something different all right so euthanasia is what we refer to as mercy killing now you can read upon that and what i wanted to do is to find out which country uh it is allowed so we spoke about negative eugenics we spoke about selective breeding we spoke about positive eugenics we spoke about social engineering i will want to look at this thing that we have in genetics on the 2016 biology paper, the last question, number six, look at carriers. Now, sickle cell anemia is a recessive allele. And in order for it to be acquired, you must acquire it in its homozygous recessive form. Now, there are some persons in the population that will be uh, heterozygous for the trait. What it means is that they have one of the allele for uh, sickle cell and one normal allele. Now, these persons, they can cause the sickle cell disease to process and never come out of the gene pool. How is it so? Persons who naturally have sickle cell anemia, which is a recessive condition, 
one that you do really don't want to be a part of the gene pool. They usually die from malaria. However, persons who have the trait for sickle cell, they are somewhat resistant to malaria. Now look what happens. When we have a cross between two carriers, are two persons that are heterozygous for the trait, there's a 50% possibility that we're going to be having offsprings that are also carriers. So they will live to survive malaria. There's a 25% that you might have a normal child. And there's also a 25% chance that you will have a child that has full-blown sickle cell. Our concern here as persons who are practicing eugenics is the persons we refer to as carriers. They have the disease, they have the undesirable trait, and you can't look at them and determine whether or not they are suffering or they are carrying the trait. You don't even know yourself that you are a carrier for the particular trait. So you met Mr. Wilson, you don't know. Mr. Wilson is a carrier. You didn't know that Amoy is a carrier as well. So Amoy and Mr. Wilson, we link up and we have an offspring. We are both carriers for sickle cell anemia. What tend to happen is that we have a 50% chance that the first child that we have might be a carrier as well. There's a 25% chance, one in four, that a child might be normal. And there's a one in four chance that the child might have full-fledged disease. However, if you look on the big picture here, there's a three in four chance that the child will be affected by sickle cell. Three out of four chance that the child will be affected by sickle cell. Let me see what Amor is saying. All right, first, uh, Campbell is saying, I think it's the lack of education about it. A uh, lack of education is one, but you have educated persons who are still making decisions that are not informed by uh, the growth of the population or the strength of the family or the introduction of desirable characteristic in your gene pool or the maintenance of desirable characteristic in your gene pool. And there are those persons who know that they have this unfavorable characteristic. They are not sharing it when they are getting in a relationship because they too are practicing eugenics to ensure that their gene pool is somewhat upgraded. And if it were uh, upgraded, then it could mean good for their gene pool moving forward. There are persons who know they have the trait and they are practicing the engineering to see if over years it will be removed from their gene pool. Now, there are some persons who are nice and dandy, they don't know, and they get trapped in things like this. Now, am I? People know they have the trait and still have children with someone with the trait and have multiple children too. And what happens after that, Amoy? That is true. What happens after that? What's the point you are defending? I don't want to, to say what you want to say. I don't know what you're saying. I want you to tell me what happens. That is true. I agree with you. All right, let me see what does that mean here, Goldburn. Uh, just, like, just like did COVID. You might have and don't know. Yeah, you might have COVID and you don't know. Uh, the body is treating with that. Let me see what Camden said. I thought it, it would be 50-50. Now, 50-50 is about the inheritance of sex. So remember, there are many different types of inheritance. So when you talk about 50-50, that's inheritance of sex. Now, how do we get around this problem? How do we get around this problem of this unfavorable trait? Three of which you would have studied in your genetic classes. The three traits you would have looked at that are unfavorable would have been sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, hemophilia. Those are three that I can remember well that you would have studied, and there are others. Now, to overcome these, we need to, before we get into a relationship, go into genetic counseling. Well, let me ask you a question, Amai. 
In our culture in Jamaica, every man must have a youth. Now, I wanting to have my desire to have a child, and I know that I'm a carrier. I am going to go to Do you really expect me to go to genetic counseling for them to tell me that this is not a wise idea? No. There's this ethical issue that surrounds uh, producing an offspring. And because of that, families, the human race, as it were, for a uh, moving undesirable trait, is suffering from that which we refer to as tragedy of the common. Now, I don't know if it is ever going to be ethical for the government to decide who should or should not have children. I don't know if that is ever going to be ethical for the government to determine who should or should not have children. Am I? Some people just like uh, taking chances. I don't think they know how high the risk is. Well, if you were supposed to look at Beethoven, and if I remember the story well, his mother had uh, probably about seven or eight trying children, and then came uh, Beethoven, this beautiful composer. So what can I say? Persons just wanting to have a child, and like Amoy would have said, persons are just willing to take the risk, and ask me, it is overly selfish. Ask me, it is overly selfish. Now, what are some of the challenges with positive eugenics? What are some of the, the challenges with positive eugenics? Now, one of the big things is to know whether the positive trait is as a result of nature or nurture so we get now into what we call the nature, nurture, nature, nurture controversy. So we have, of course, the genetics. This, this desired trait, is it as a result of the gene pool? Or is it that this desired trait is as a result of my environment? Now, there's a problem there to determine really what is the cause of this uh, bad trait? Is it as a result of my inheritance are because of where I'm living and what I'm exposed to. That is a major problem when it comes to eugenics. I'd asked earlier, uh, should families be regulated and be told when or if they should have children? A question for you to think about. Everybody can't be perfect inside out. Yeah, everybody can't be perfect inside out. But why should I be the person that is not perfect? Question to be answered. We're moving on into some, some other ethical issue that you have to think about and talk about. We're looking at the last part of the syllabus. Spare part surgery. What do you think about spare part surgery? Tell me what your views are in the comment. Do you think that person should get a new heart from somebody else? Do you think that somebody should get a kidney from somebody else? Do you think a person should get a liver from somebody else? And if you so think that spare part surgery is something that we should be practicing, uh, what about persons who are killed and those spare parts removed to be sold pretty much as we sold, as a cash goal is sold, as a diamond is sold, as a... Anything that is stolen at a high and can be sold at a high price, how do we treat with that if we are going to be doing uh, organ trafficking? I don't know what it is called, but I know that it is a practice. Do you think that we should be practicing spare parts surgery? And I just gave you uh, some insight as to what is spare part surgery. It looks at you using organ from one person in another person in order to extend the person's life so somebody said yes i heard of a story as you continue to type what your views are and everything that we are going to be doing now is about your views ethical or unethical concern but these are things that you need to know moving into your exam they would fall under pretty much genetics 
All right, these are all genetic issues. I heard of an instance where a man was with a woman. You all would have heard about it. And he had one eye, just one. And he loved this woman so dearly. That one day he decided that he would have given her his height in order for her to have a view of the world. Being that she had long, she wanted to, she, she really craved to see what the world looked like. Having given her eyes, having given her the eye, she was able to see later. And when she realized that the man that she was with was blind, she decided that she could not stay with a blind man because she knew what it was like being blind. And she moved on. Now, should this man ask for the eye to be returned? Or should this man continue to now live as a single man? At one point, he had a partner that was blind. Now he's a single man and he doesn't even have his eye. What do you think? Tell me the chat. We're looking at organ transplant. We are looking pretty much at what we refer to as peer part surgery. What is it? What are your views on this topic? I do agree with that, how every uh, studies show that depending on the person, those organs were in more specifically than art can act like the owner of the organ. So, Macmillan, hi, welcome. I, I was made mention of your name earlier in the show. Uh, so, uh, Macmillan is saying, I don't have the facts on this, that if you were supposed to get a spare part like the art, and Morgan was this, uh, so let me say, Macmillan was this stuffed up person, um, and you got Mr. Wilson's art, then possibility lies that you'll start acting like Mr. Wilson. I don't know, but you can read. And all that we're looking on here, they are open-ended uh, ideas and ideas that you have to put your thoughts to as to how your children and grandchildren will live their lives. Uh, let me look at what Campbell is saying. I think it is good uh, because people that may be on the brink of death can have a second chance at life. Why you need a second chance of life? Uh, at life, don't you think that is selfish? Persons are being born every day. Why don't you just give them the space and hurt and you go move on to heaven? Uh, Campbell, you want to answer that? Uh, provocative it is. Uh, Barnett, it's sad. It's a sad case to know that he gave his eyes and that's how she felt. But no, sir. I don't think he should ask back for his <laughs> Barnet, Barnet, forgive me, you guys have never heard, you have never seen me laughing like this, but I really have to laugh. Barnet, you think you're really being fair? This man is your son. He had one eye. And he gave his eye to his fiance. And she left with the eye and now leave him as a blind man. You are saying that he should not ask for that spare part. He should just continue living as a blind man. Do you understand the depression that he's going to face as a result of this incident? It's your view, you know. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have that view. But I really find it really funny for you to say that the lady should go with the eye and he should continue living as a blind man. I would like my eye back. I, I am with you. I want back my eye. Call me Mr. Take it back. But I want back my eye. All right? I want back my eye. I'm so sorry, Barnett. Please give me back my eye. Uh, buy a new eye. Where are you going to get a new eye? Oh, so it's spear part. So we are in the spear part business. So somebody who is in an accident and they are leaving this planet, just ask them, just buy the eye and you have a new eye. Well, I want back my eye. She can go and buy that eye. I want back my eye. All right? Uh, no, let's move on. Uh, want back, uh, this is a Jamaican, Adi Plus. Me want back my eye, and she can go on, go get a life single. She can go on, go live single. Yeah, um, pretty much. 
at that point, I want back my eye. And being that the spare parts, uh, spare part technology um, is this new thing that is booming, just have her go and buy her eye. I want back my eye, and she have to go. I, I prefer to live single with my eye. I want to live with a single eye and live single as a person. I really don't want to lose my eye and lose that person and go into depression. I am sorry, Barnet. I am not on your side today. I am on Addy's side. Let me move on down and see what is happening here. All right, so, uh, but they are risk of practicing it because the body can reject the organ. Usually, once you have an organ transplant, you must take medication in order for the body to keep that organ because usually the body is going to, of course, try to reject that organ. So you are on medication like for the rest of your life. All right, Amar Lawrence, not technically, you can't buy body parts. It's, it's not ethical or legal. Well, it's not ethical or legal to buy body parts, but I know that in Jamaica, you can donate a kidney. I remember, and I have a lot of story. That's that. That's what makes me a teacher. Teachers have a lot of story. I have seen on TikTok. Was it TikTok? Where this man, the family oversee, <laughs> overseas, and asked him to donate his kidney because he was in Jamaica and probably the poor. He's a, um, pretty much from the less affluent side of the family. So those who were overseas that had more money. They were donating his body parts without his permission. So they were saying, hey, Mr. Wilson, like how you are in Jamaica, you are the best person to give your kidney. And trust me, that did not go down well. I don't know how many persons saw that video, but I watched that video a million times. I have seen that facial expression and I'm even laughing now. So this whole idea of using organ of somebody as spear part surgery um, it might not be ethical, but spiritual part surgery is a fact. There are organs that have been transplant, transplanted from one person to another. It might not be something ethical, but it is, of course, true. We have seen movies that are showing persons really buying organs, and there are persons who are uh, getting organs from persons and shipping them to places, and those who are effluent. It is happening. And we are seeing documentaries in Africa where persons are removing organs on the black market, ending up with infection and all of that. It is happening, Amoy. It is happening. And that is why we're having this conversation that we can be aware and we can talk to our offspring. We can talk to those persons around us that there are unethical practices like organ uh, donation, uh, organ sale, uh, spear part surgery. We have to talk about this. Let us not put our heads in the sun. It is human and social biology, and your governments across the Caribbean want you to know about that, and that is why Mr. Wilson is presenting it. Tamara Barnett. Yes, sir, I know she's going to be... It's not she... Uh, oh, I know he's going to be depressed, and probably is going to need a lot of counseling in order to get through a situation like that. But you know what, sir? Sometime in life, it's not fear. Yes. And because I know that sometime in life, it is not fear. Me want back me. I, me no want no counseling. You know who want counseling? Who never have no eye. And them need a counseling. Me want back my eye, brother. Me want back my eye. Uh, for those persons who don't understand, that's a little Jamaican. I would really want my eyes to be returned. All right? Great. I saw it. All right, great. So person saw that uh, that transplant video, and it was really funny if you ask me. So, sir, will you say donation of blood is also not ethical? Always remember, you see, Mr. Wilson is this unorthodox person. Yes, the whole concept of wrong and right, it is a self-construed concept that is either trained to a person or brought on based on what you have learned. Wrong and right, what makes something wrong or what makes something right? When I was going to school, we had nine planets. It was right then. No, I'm told that we have eight. So what is really wrong or what is really right? Can wrong and right change over time? So too, 
the whole concept of ethics. Who determine what is ethical or what is not ethical? That is left up to a person and in some case a country. We have gone to courts and we have seen a lot of things that is, all right, let us look at the whole concept as it were in Jamaica. If uh, and we have to talk about these things, these things are on the syllabus somewhere, somewhere. If you have a boy in Jamaica who is nine year old and he was supposed to get involved with a 15 year old, he would have been guilty of rape, statutory rape. He would be charged. Now, he's nine, you know. She's 15. Where is the ethics or the moral in that? You know what stands? Law. You know why law? Because it's a woman who drives the growth of the population. So if we can protect the woman from penis and the sperms, then we can manage our population. So when we look at ethics, I don't even know where to draw the line, where to start or where to stop. I see some ladies walking on the road in their tights alone, or tights and underwear. And they are showing their bedroom, their veranda, and the car porch at the front. And when I see that, I usually say, if my grandmother that I grew with was supposed to raise from the grave, and she was supposed to see a woman dressed like that, what would she say? So what is really ethical? Who determines what is ethical? And that is why we are having a debate where these topics are concerned. There is no hang up right and wrong to it. And that is why government can't really take a stance to say, or they are not taking a stance to say that this is what it should be, or this is what it should not be. Hi, this also welcome to the show. All right, so we look at spare part and it really sparks some interesting discussion. We are going to look at biotechnology now. And these are some of these things are now at work and we need to understand what is happening. I know we have seen a lot of things on TikTok about plastic rice and plastic this and plastic that. Ooh. When we finish with this lesson, uh, we might have a problem. So let's look at biotechnology. Now, biotechnology is the use of biological organism or processes. So it's biological organism or processes. on a large scale for, of course, be beneficial effect. So we are using biological processes or biological uh, um, organism in order to benefit ourselves. Now, the first thing I want to look at when it comes to biotechnology is, of course, what we refer to as microorganism. Now, the school of thought that we grew up with where microorganisms are concerned, we grew up and we were told that they are bad. We call them germs. We call them disease. What else we call microorganisms outside of germs? All right? So we call them all these bad names that we were taught that they were all bad and you must use sanitizer and you must sanitize everything that there is. At which point we did not know that some of these microbes are actually assisting us to stay alive. We're going to be looking at some of the uses of microbes and we would have looked at them uh, throughout the syllabus. But let us look at our brewing, the brewing industry, where we looked at anaerobic respiration, where we are using the yeast in order to produce alcohol. And we go on and on with the yogurt. We go on and on with the cheese, right? In this industry, we are using microorganisms. We are using bacteria. We are using fungus, right, for the purposes of food. And when we see these things pop up on TikTok and somebody say, Oh, he's using bacteria to make food. We're not eating anything else. But we have always been doing that. Our cheese, our yogurt. Yogurt has this tangy taste because of the microbes that is in it. Now, another thing, we look at the processing of dairy products. Microbes is also a part of the processing of dairy pro products. But let us look at this big one, this breakthrough in medicine, Amoy. The whole idea of using penicillin. Penicillin is from a fungus. And when you, uh, when you pick up this bacteria that we call the gonococcus bacteria that causes gonorrhea, it is the penicillin that is saving your life. And the penicillin is from a fungus. 
I want to say microbes are all bad. Let's kill them off. Because humans really want to live on the earth by themselves, you know. They think that nothing else is important than the five things that they eat. So they eat rice and flour, banana and bread food, chicken, pork, and uh, mutton. And everything else that is on the earth, they can all die. That's, all, that's all our, our school of thought. And that is why when we have that school of thought, we have to go back to the whole concept of the food chain, of the food web, and understand that we are a part of an ecological community. And if those organisms don't survive, then we won't survive either because we have to rely on each other to survive. Then there's also, we remember when we were doing sewage a while ago, we spoke about this uh, food chain that assists with breaking down the sewage. So we can talk about the protozoa in sewage treatment. We can talk about the bacteria in sewage treatment. If we did not have that and the amount of sewage that we have on a day-to-day -day basis, how would we deal with that? You know what would happen? Cholera and typhoid would be raging. I uh, would probably have five persons living in Jamaica. Mr. Wilson would be one, of course. God is not ready for me. All right. So we'd probably just have five persons in Jamaica, one person in Trinidad, probably a half a person in St. Vincent. Who knows? But because of these microbes, we are having this large population across the earth because they are helping us to live. So we can't be selfish and want to kill everything and stay on the earth um, by ourselves. So remember that microbes are used in sewage and water treatment. So these are some uses of microbes. We use them in respiration, as it were, for brewing. We use them for cheese. We use them for yogurt, uh, for dairy product, processing a dairy product. We remember penicillin, uh, that is from a microbe, or uh, from, uh, one would say, a fungus. Uh, we remember um, the bacteria and the protozoa that is using uh, water treatment. All right? Now, there is another concept. So the first thing we looked at here, we looked at microorganism um, in biotechnology. So how can we use microorganism to benefit ourselves? How can we use microorganism to live longer? How can we use a microorganism in food, in medicine, in our day-to-day -day life? That is what we've just looked at with microorganism. A lot of persons probably didn't see where we were going with that, but of course we are. And artificial insulin. We are going there. That is the um, recombinant technology that we need to discuss. All right, great. Uh, usually we get insulin from animals. Now we have uh, other things, bacteria making in insulin. All right, let me see what's happening here again. Decomposers too. So remember that uh, decomposers refers to the bacteria and fungi. And remember they are from a big group we refer to as saprophytes. And within saprophytes, there are two groups that we look at. We look at the detritivore, which are the larger organisms. So those persons who were asking me when the broad topic came out, uh, what decompose, decomposers mean? I would have used them several times in the lesson deliberately. We use them when we are looking at the carbon cycle. We use them to uh, in respiration. We are using them here now with biotechnology. We are seeing a couple of them being used here in biotechnology. So when we talk about decomposer, there are so many uses, all right, of decomposers. We can see it when we are doing brewing. We can see it with penicillin. These are positive uses of decomposers. We can see it when we are composting. And it goes on and on and never ending. These are some additional use of decomposers. Thank you very much, Campbell. Now, we are going to move on into something new. Uh, we're going to look at selective breeding, which is another biotechnology uh, measure. And we would remember for those persons who are in Jamaica and those persons who would have gone to agriculture, you'd have heard about the Jamaica Hope, the Jamaica Black, you'd have heard about T.P. Lecky, and you'd have heard about a lot of hybrid organisms that were uh, pretty much brought about by selective breeding. In some cases, they are crossing animals to bring about animals that have desirable trait. I can quickly think about the donkey and the horse being crossed to produce what is called a mule. And the mule is so, the mule is this um, organism. It is not able to uh, breed, of course. But what makes the mule desirous or desirable? It is because persons who are in rural community, they needed an organism that is much higher than the donkey to traverse the bush terrain and as strong as the donkey to carry the load, 
right? So they went for the mule instead of the donkey. So that was a selective breathing that took place there. We saw, we saw the Jamaica folk, uh, we, we saw the Jamaica black, and uh, all this was uh, Dr. T.P. Lecky working on these animals to uh, find a breed that would produce a lot of milk and would also find another breed that would also provide a lot of meat. So that is selective breeding. We are breeding organisms to ensure that they are desirable characteristics that is, of course, going to benefit us. What are the advantages of selective breeding? You are, of course, going to get desirable characteristics, things that persons are going to envy. All right? Now, this is another thing we are going to move on. So we look at selective breeding. We look at microorganisms, and we're still under biotechnology. The other thing we want to look at is animal and the type of food from plant. So animal. Uh, type of food from plant. Now, this is a big question on the HSB paper. I don't know why it is so popular. Or I probably know why it is so popular. Because when I read that question, I realize why it is so popular. Am I? If I have 100 head of cattle, they need how much acre land to eat grass. And they are going to damage the soil, they will say, and all of that. They are going to belch and release methane, which is ozone gas, and all the, all the negative things they are now going to tell you about cattle production. But what we have seen with soya bean is that soya bean is this different type of plant. Let me tell you something I don't remember, but I can go in the textbook and tell you. Uh, if you go to your textbook in nutrition and you look at the nutritional value of soya bean, You'll realize that soya bean, don't move there. I'm going into the textbook and I'll also show you the textbook because I try not to act as if content is mine when it is not mine. I am going to just tell you. Just give me one second. I'm hopping into the textbook. I did answer a question on soya bean, but there's something I want to give you from a graph with soya bean. Uh, one second. A soya bean, where are you? Don't give me that. All right, great. So now I find it. And I'm looking in this textbook. All right. And it nicely answers the soya bean question. See this graph at the bottom there? Uh, this here represents the soya bean. This represents the soya bean and the nutrient content. And this represents beef and the nutrient content. So you're looking at this and you're looking at that. All right? So soya bean is said to contain more calcium and more protein than beef. So what does that mean? Is soya bean is also cheaper to produce than beef. So with soya bean being that alternative to meat, look at what is happening with soya bean. It has more protein. Yes, yes, soya bean. Now look at what is happening with soya bean. Now soya bean is no process to taste like meat. And to look like meat. So this is biotechnology, you know. So some of us, oh, I want chicken. I don't want any peas. What you think? Every day you're giving me this plant to eat. You think I am a goat? They use soya bean for milk. They use soya bean. And they process it for it to look like meat. And you talk about the that they make with it and all of that. So this is a biotechnology where soya bean is processed to look like meat. And a vegetarian eat it as for protein. Everybody can eat it as protein because it has more protein than beef. Everybody should be eating it as protein because it's cheaper. Hey, next time I go to the supermarket, I'm going to get myself some soya bean instead of a piece of steak. Then after we move away from a uh, plant food that is processed to be like animal food. We want to look at the concept of tissue culture. Tissue culture. Now, when we think about Dolly the sheep, it is unethical to clone man. But tissue culture is an asexual method of reproduction where identical offspring is formed. With tissue culture, as it were, for plant, we can produce plants very quickly. all the omic department at school and we had long discussion around soya bean and they had their concern i had my concern but one thing they told me is that uh soya bean is like a complete meal i remember that stood out from the conversation we had because i'm this teacher who call another teacher and what do you think about this what, is, what are your views that type of thing 
uh, that is always good. Always call on somebody. You can't know everything, and even if you know something, you need some somebody to strengthen what you know. That's how we go. So with tissue culture, what happens is that we have a single cell that is selected from the desired organism, and the single cell is cultured to produce tissue of a similar uh, plant. So you have one plant and you want another one. You get a single cell. It is cultured to produce tissue and eventually cover, uh, creating that plant pretty much just from the tissue. This is another biotechnology in order to ensure that we live and live probably longer than three score and ten. Then there is what we refer to. My father uh, eat a lot of it. He is vegetarian and eat no meat. Great. So I know that someday, Barnett, you would have seen your father eating it and think that it is meat. No, it is processed to look like meat and taste like meat, but it is not meat. Then this is the part now where Amoy is going to have a little problem. This part that we refer to as the artificially produced food. Artificial. Everybody know that once it's artificial, it is man-made. So can you imagine man making food for me? I, I, I thought that God was in the kitchen. God was creating the food. But no man is saying that, listen to me, God seems to be creating food too slow. And um, the planes won't carry them for free. So I will just make food for myself. So what we have now is that we have man creating what we call artificial food, which is, of course, again, made from a fungus. A fungus we refer to as fusarium. Fusarium, it is cultured by food fermentation to make a fiber-rich protein. All right, and the fiber rich protein uh, food, which is called mycoprotein, mycoprotein, microprotein, mycoprotein, M Y C O, mycoprotein. So the fungus fossarium is cultured by man, it is artificial fruit to make what we refer to as mycoprotein. Now the fungus is grown on a simple carbohydrate, all right? So they grow the fungus on a simple car carbohydrate to make this protein. So of course you are seeing that man, we are doing a whole lot to ensure that we live until God come back. We really don't want to die. We want to be here to ensure that we can dance and party and have all of that. Then there is what we refer to as genetic engineering and that which we refer to as a recombinant technology. Just let me see if I can find a link and send you a link on the uh, insulin production uh, recombinant. All right, so I'm trying to see if I can find something on the recombinant technology just to show you what happens. Uh, just give me a, a second here. So we're looking at genetic engineering, and when we talk about insulin production, we are talking about the and it. So if you read it and it is not 100%, just send back to me in the chat and I will try to find something. But the recombinant technology, it is in the textbook I showed you just now and you want to ensure that you try to visit the book to get the content. The other thing is that we have what we refer to as genetically modified food. Uh, we could think about golden rice uh, uh, for vitamin A. We could think about that. Uh, we could also think about something that we call stem cell research, all right? So we need to look at, uh, for yourselves, you need to look at insulin production uh, by the recombinant DNA. What I will do, I will teach a lesson again, only looking at that part of the, uh, uh, only looking at the recombinant technology, and I will give you and explain exactly what is happening at each step, or I'll do an animation because it's not well taught by me just talking. It's not something that you just talk and persons learn. Uh, we can talk about genetically modified food. There are many of them we can think about. You can type in GMO to get more on that. And then the other thing is on stem cell research. Now, I think the 2018 paper it is would have the population graph, population pyramid. When I do that paper, Wherever the pyramid is, I will teach about the pyramid. So I will spend some time on the pyramid, probably giving you some other pyramids so that you will have a good appreciation of it. Should you see this pyramid in the exam again, you are going to be able to take care of yourself in the exam. This brings us to the end of one year 
of teaching online classes to you, my students. I'm very, very happy and pleased I was given the opportunity to teach you. I'm very, very happy and pleased that we are, we've been here so long and we have grown to be one big family that we can call each other name, we can run joke, we can say a lot of things and persons are not hurt or be drawn up by what we have said. I want to remind us that there are many videos, uh, pretty close to 300 videos on the channel, and uh, we continue to make videos for you. Uh, we're going to be working a couple of past papers that you are going to be having at your disposal so that you can get exam ready. We are going to be continuing with what's the difference. We're going to be looking at some of these things. Like we said, that we'll have to do activated sludge and, and the biological filter method so that you can see the real difference. So we are going to be working on putting our papers, putting our content to get you exam ready. For those persons who missed the live last night, last night we looked at uh, graph and tables. We were pending the variable. If you understand how to make the scale for a graph, then your problem with graph is over and you are going to be getting full marks for your graph. But like I have said, I am really, really, un I I really, really happy I got the opportunity to share with you. I'm going to ask you as much as possible, choose whichever video you so desire. And I want you to write a reflection of a time. How was it spent? Was it worth it? If it wasn't worth it, that type of a thing, what we can do better, what we, that type of a thing. I love to hear from you. If you want to send me an email, that is fine. I'd really appreciate that. So just get your feedback so that we can better the product that we're having. Now, fruits and vegetables are also modified. Thank you, sir. I have learned a lot from your classes. Uh, I am praying for a one. So I hope that you are working for that one more than just praying because it is said that God helped those who help themselves. So you can't give up now. You are going to be burning the night oil. Please know that go overbound. Make sure that you practice our overboard. Make sure that you practice. Make sure that you pay attention. The past paper question, we know that most of these questions will be repeated. We know what the broad topics are. Make sure that you are finding videos, making your playlist. So don't keep coming back to Mr. Wilson channel to find a video. When you come to Mr. Wilson channel and you find a video that you like, click like. Once you like the video, it will go to your playlist. That, that way, your study will be easier. So suppose you like Mr. Wilson 2020 paper that has 10,000 views so far and you want it to be a part of your playlist. Just click on it and it will go to your playlist. Suppose you want Mr. Wilson um, genetic classes, all of Mr. Wilson genetic classes, just like them. And once you like them, they will go to your playlist. So when you are ready to study, you just go into your playlist to look for what you want to study. So you should have developed playlists within your YouTube channel so that you can study at ease and you can reach out to these various persons who are a part of your support group. Now, please be reminded that everyone needs a support group. Everyone need a support group. While I will not be teaching content because we have covered the entire syllabus, uh, please be reminded that I'll be around, I'll be putting up videos, uh, videos that are pertinent to your success. So of course, I am just a mail away or I am just a comment away. Uh, you'll be having me responded. Uh, everyone in the room has HSB 20. Uh, anyone in the room has it? Okay, great. If anyone in the room has HSB 21, 2020, 2021 paper one, please send it to my email address so I can work it and send it out for you. We don't have the paper one, but we have the uh, paper two. We have 2021 for biology. We have not posted it yet, but we can post the 2021 paper two for biology. Yes, we have that paper. Uh, we would have posted the 2021 for HSB, and I think that is doing well. Uh, I think it is doing well. I don't remember. I know we have not posted the 2021 for biology, but yes, we have the 2021 for biology. We are going to be working on that. I am working hard for a uh, hard, sir. Did a mock exam? I got 65 on paper two and 76 on paper one yesterday. I really, really am happy for you. I celebrate with you. But um, I am sort of this teacher who, um, if students fail my mock exam, I am almost happier. Why? Sometimes you need to get that shock, that fubulator, boop, that shock to say, hey, you need to turn up the flame. 
right? But I'm happy that you did well on the exams. And I hope that this does not mean that we are going to turn on the flame. It means that we are going to be blazing. So now that you have that, you need to now start looking at some exam paper, being able to, uh, to answer this question with great ease and make sure that you are doing as much practice as possible. We spent almost a week just putting our graphs, putting our graphs. Now we are going to be looking at putting our past papers for you. And we are also going to be working on what's the difference. That's the two main things that we are going to be doing for you now that the syllabus would have been completed. Sir, do sir, do a past paper question on reproductive system. Okay, uh, what part of a reproductive system? Because the, the 2016 had uh, the 2016 uh, bio paper that I sent out just now had the female reproductive system, right? So that's, and it had uh, birth contraceptive and so on. So I would have done something on that. But what exactly on the reproductive system? Uh, I think we need to look at thrombosis. I'm going to be sending out something on that. But we're going to try to do as many as we can, uh, providing my workload is not so hard. But remember that I still work while I try to assist you. Uh, thank you, sir. I have learned a lot from your classes. I am really grateful and humble. I, I do hope that after the exam, when the results are out, uh, you guys will be sending me uh, messages here, there, and everywhere, and we can have a live to talk about it. I promise you, however, if I am able to get the exam paper after the exam, if I'm able to get your paper to exam paper, once you send it to me within a week thereabout, providing I have time, we will work the paper and have it posted that you can, I don't know if it's going to scare some person, but we are going to work it and try to get it out really, really early. But we, we are so confident that most persons are going to be doing well and most persons are going to come back to celebrate the victory. All right, Amoy, I know you are going to get the one this time around. I am so confident. I'm, I'm sure you are going to be getting that one. Oh, the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle is the toughest thing in reproduction. A lot of students can't get it. And I, I've been trying to decode as to what is the problem with the menstrual cycle. I think the problem with the menstrual cycle is that we are talking about so many things. I will have three graphs stuck on each other, and we really don't know what is happening. What I will try to do, I'll try to put all three graphs in one, and if we put all three graphs in one, we might be able to have a better appreciation of what is happening and when it is happening. So if we probably put two animation together, we might be able to do that. But animation takes a little time to write, because I write my own animation and they usually take me a time. Sometimes I start and the concept that I had, it changed somewhere within the within uh, putting together the animation or something just go wrong. And because I'm writing an animation for um, non-reducing sugar, every part of the animation is already done. All I need to do is to stack them on each other like that so that the color can change. And that has been like long, 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 long time. And I have not done it. I have done the carbon cycle and carbon sink and all of that. Long, long time I've done that video. And I've done it and I've not posted it. So sometimes the, the, the thought that you have behind something, it would have changed. And because it changed and you really can't find the rhythm to go again, sometimes some things just stay. But um, I definitely we need to look at the menstrual cycle. Because every time the menstrual cycle comes, you're all bold. Every time the menstrual cycle comes, you're all bold. So that's going to be from me and Anai and my partner and the entire family here who have been supporting in the background. Uh, they have given up a whole lot of time for me to be with you. I do appreciate the fact that they have given the time. For me, it's like a world of experience. Uh, doing the syllabus so fast, going through the syllabus, having students that were receptive, having students that even on a Sunday, they are here. It really, really, really meant a lot to me. And if I must say, you have actually uh, probably awoken the teacher in me to teach. I am not doing so much um, student-centered teaching here, but even that I'm getting better at that, my student-centered approach uh, outside of the lecture method. So I am really, really grateful to have had the opportunity to be with you. With that said, we will not have an organized class for Sunday. No, I will not have a class for Sunday. Uh, sometime during, during the week, next week, what we might have is not live 
we will have one and two lives. We'll definitely have some life because I'm going to come on to tell you some story and so on. I have a lot of story to tell. All right. I might just tell you one before you make your way. Uh, I will tell you one that I shared today. It's a rather interesting story, and I think I should tell you before I leave. All right, so um, we'll have what we call premiere, where we'll do a past paper and we will premiere it on the time of a class. So while the past paper is on screen being explained, you will be able to talk in the chat right here about what is happening on screen, and I'll be on the other end that we can treat with it. I am not putting past paper on screen because I use a software and my computer can't manage it. All right, so that is why we have not been sharing the past papers and working them together. All right, so I leave you with this show. I leave you with this story. The story is pretty personal. No one truly knows your capability. There are persons who will win a race from the start. There are persons who will win the race from the middle. And there are some persons who will win the race at the finish line. Because no one knows for sure what you can do, how you can do, and what your fortunes will be, you should not allow anyone to tell you that you can't. Neither should you allow the grades that you have been getting to tell you that you can't. There is always possibility in the future. I tell a story of my son, my eldest son. When he went to preschool, I was called to follow his mother to primary school. She wanted to get him into a quote-unquote favorable primary school. Despite being a member or despite being employed to the Ministry of Education in Jamaica, I was not able to get my son into this quote-unquote government school, even when I declared that I was a teacher. My son was asked to do a test, having left kindergarten, where you went to say A, B, C, one, two, three. And can you believe a child leaving kindergarten to enter grade one was deemed as a failure? He failed the exam to attend primary school? I couldn't believe my life that anybody could tell a child in grade one that he or she has failed an exam. It happened to my child in Jamaica. This is not commonplace for our schools in Jamaica. This is not a mandate of the Ministry of Education in Jamaica, but this is a practice by a school in Jamaica. Broken, torn, I had to get my son in another school. He went to a school that most persons didn't want to go. The school was pretty close to a mal malfunctioning sewage plant. If a sewage plant is malfunctioning, for the entire day, the order that will come your way will definitely not be pleasant. But thanks to the olfactory cells in the nostril, you won't be able, you won't be smelling it for the entire day. I visited the school and I was pleased what I saw when I went to the school. Having gone through the gate, the school was pretty much, it had an inviting environment, though there was not much land space to play. It was a whole lot of concrete. But the principal and her team nicely decorated the school with things that were uplifting and supportive of learning. My son went through grade one, two, three, up to grade six. I know my son probably more, better than most persons, and he's not one of the rigid boy. Is that? 
stocked up or conservative human that seldomly say a word would be observing, not like his dad is observing. And very rare, you might hear him say something or decide to engage in a conversation. I had a real, I, I, I have a real close relationship with my son. And why I have this close relationship is probably what happened in his earlier years. In his earlier years, about weeks after he was born, he was said to have had hydroscophilus. Hydroscophilus is a disease where the brain retains, or the, the cranium retains water. If this happens, the head will grow large. I had just weeks to fix the problem. But when I did my research, I found out, though it is a problem that affects so many, if you have the, if you have the money and the wherewithal, it's not so much of a real problem. A shunt can be installed and it will leak the water down in the stomach. So naturally, my son at the time, his head was not as small as the average child in his class. I'm going back and forth. We took him to the best neurosurgeon, they say, in Jamaica. And the neurosurgeon, having looked at him and measured the head, the neurosurgeon said, the little boy is fine. He doesn't have hydroscopolis. He has a head that is bigger than everyone. Pretty much like my head, the neurosurgeon said. Probably he's just smarter than other persons. He tried to find out from me what my family tree was like. So then we had to dis dig down now what grandmother, great grandmother, who, who on the family tree would have that size head. I'm not too sure if we got it right, but we settled on the fact that he did not have hydroscopolis. So my son is a little conscious of the size of his head, but luckily, he would have grown for the body to match the size of the head. So that is probably one of the reasons why he's withdrawn. Grade six came. Having known that my son is a little withdrawn, having known that he's, one would say, a soft boy, having known that he's a boy that will fight at any time and tell you anything that comes to his lip in defense of himself. I decided I would have sent him to two schools, either of two schools that I thought was fitting to his character. I filled out the paper for high school and we sent it into the primary school to be submitted. The paper was returned. The teacher communicated to us that this was not a good idea. You can't send your child, can't fill out the form for this school because your child is not at that level to pass to go to any of those schools. And if your child doesn't pass to go to one of these schools, they are going to place him at any old school. I am a teacher, but you know what I heard? I heard that they are going to send him to one of those schools that person stigmatized. That's the only thing I heard. So following the teacher's advice, the teacher decided which school he should go. Call me what you want to call me, but when a parent's panic, uh, you'll allow anyone to lead the way. Of course, can a teacher be wrong? No. So I followed the teacher and I signed up the document for the school. It is a new school, a school with great promise that a teacher decided that would have been a better school for him to go. I followed the teacher's instruction because, of course, the teacher is right. Exam came. My son, was, who was never a person who was at the top of the table, he was not the flagship student. He was not that boy who was carrying the teacher duster and an um, textbook. He wasn't qualified for that. He wasn't as bright as the teacher said. The teacher said it, not me. For me, He's a child and someday he'll bloom. Wherever I bloom, that's fine for me. It's my son, Marine, no matter. I'm a son. If I become a lawyer, doctor, I just become Mr. Wilson. 
I'm fine. It's my child. I'm not a doctor lawyer. I would love for him to be something a little more than me. But suppose him can't get there. What should I do? Abandon him? No, I'm not going to do that. Not Mr. Wilson. Exam came and he sat the exams. Didn't sit, sit the exam in a trying time like COVID. Sat the exam under normal condition like every and anybody. Exam result came out and I realized that he was getting a hundred in some of the papers, 80s and 90s. And I'm like, but the teacher said you couldn't make it. What is happening? It turned out that my son was the only child for that teacher who aced it. He graduated with a couple of awards. I looked, I was proud of him. I'm not the father who beat a child to say that you must be the brightest person in the class. Because as a teacher, I know that the brightest person in the class might not be bright any at all. Got his award. He's attending high school now. The game is not over, but we can talk about what the accomplishment has been so far. He's at a school that I am satisfied, though the teacher said that he shouldn't have gone to the school I wanted him to go. I'm satisfied with the school that he's attending that the teacher recommended. But luckily, it is a good school too. My son is in a class. And in that class, there are about 40 students. And if you have a grade, if you were supposed to be ranked in that class, 38. Tell me in the chat what you think a child who ranks 38 out of 40 students. Tell me what you think the likely average for that child would be in such a class. Tell me in the chat. I'm coming back to the comments. I'm going to read them all. But tell me, chat, what you think a child going to a school is in a class with 40 students. And a child that is ranked 38 out of 40, what should be the average or the likely average of this child? What do you think the average is? Tell me in the chat as I look at what is happening on the screen. Sir, do a pass paper. I've seen that. Uh, thank you, sir. I have learned a lot. Yes, am I? Mentor cycle, sir. Really appreciate it because my school is lacking. I'm so sorry, Barnett. I'm really sorry. Uh, but you have prepared a lot. All right, great. Just go to the live and you'll see all the lessons. We're not going to be removing them. Thank you, sir. I have learned so much from you two in a short time. I, I was here. All right, great. You can go on and watch the many videos on the channel. All right, great. So in this class, a child that has a... When, uh, what I said, 38 out of 40, they would have an average of anywhere above 75 and 80. This class is a class that is performing. When you come second in the class, it is by 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, that sort of a thing. Now, do you understand where I'm going? So if you have a child that is performing at 75, 80, they're about, and it's coming last in the class. No, certainly not 42. Those grades don't happen at that school. I don't think so. I don't think anybody at that school have a 42 grade. No, I don't think that. Some schools don't have those grades. They don't know what those grades are. I'm of that opinion. So you understand that to talk about a child being first is nothing to argue about. First really doesn't count here. Here you're looking at, is the child performing or is the child not performing? So with the experiences from my son, I can share with you, if you were not doing well any at all from September until now, because the future is something is in front of you, you still have enough time to get it right. Don't pressure yourself. Don't become too anxious. Don't try to be anybody else. Just try to be yourself. Once you are yourself, all is well. Don't be too hard on yourself. Go for it. You can. 
I remember when I was at your stage, it was yonder years ago. I mean, yonder years ago. I have done so many studies so far. I, 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 I really, I, I, I've done so many studies, you know? Sometimes I think I know too much and it is more of a nuisance to me than really helping. All right, because I, I'm always telling, telling and persons my back, how oh, you know so much, how oh, you know so much. I have studied so much. I spend every day reading, every day. My English is still not good though. So I have to work on that. I think Barnett and Amoy and all those persons, uh, Audrey, uh, Barnett, uh, yeah, all these persons, Aisha, all these persons will have to make up and give me a proper English class that my grammar can be on par and I can pretty much improve in that area. It was really, really nice being with you. I do hope that all will be well and I will see you around. All right, remember, if you never get to the top of the mountain, make sure you show someone the way. All right, good evening and all the best.